Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast, where we teach clients how to build wealth and create passive income without the risk of Wall Street. Anthony, we just got done wrapping up our conversation with Liz Nowen from Mid-South Home Buyers. And uh, man, what a great conversation, huh? Yeah, I, I mean, I have heard her on other podcasts. I've talked to her personally, looked at the website, and each time I talk to her, I am I, I am learning learn something new. So did I. I was I was really impressed. Um, man, she went through. She kind of listed pretty much their entire business process or business cycle. I mean, from beginning to end, and she knew that inside and out. So I was really impressed by how much information she was able to kind of share with our share with us about uh, kind of turnkey real estate, what to look for on the front end, some of the uh, pros and cons uh, that people should be looking out for from specific turnkey providers, and then also kind of uh, what separates them on the back end with that property management piece. What I like is, you know, a lot of our clients want passive income. Mm -hmm. A lot of them aren't sure how to get there. Maybe they've, maybe they've read Rich Dad, Poor Dad or some books on real estate, but they're not a real estate expert. And maybe they don't want to be a landlord. So then how can they create some passive income using real estate? And with a turnkey provider, as Liz is going to explain, kind of takes a lot of that stuff off the table, where really they find it, they find a tenant, they sell it to the investor and they manage it. So a lot of that grunt work and the horror stories that I've always heard about real estate, I, a lot of those burdens and risks are going to be taken off the table because of their management experience. And one thing we didn't talk about in the interview, and I think we need to do a little bit more of this at some point, is we need to also be looking at some issues with taxes. And as you know, taxes is one of the biggest eroders of your wealth. And what I found, really I found two key ways to where you can take advantage of the tax code. One, if you've been listening to us, is life insurance. There is a lot of tax benefits of life insurance. There's You don't pay taxes on the growth. You have the ability to access uh, the money. Now, real estate, on the other hand, there's a lot of great tax advantages. There's the depreciation that you can take, in the, in, particularly in those first couple of years. Oftentimes, the depreciation expense is going to be higher than, than your cash flow. In essence, what that means is you're not paying tax on all of the income you are receiving. In addition, when you do sell it, it's there's also, it could be um, a long-term capital gain rate, which is one, which is the lowest, which is the lowest tax rate. So if you combine the tax advantages of real estate and you use it, you use like the IBC method that we've been talking about for the down payment. I mean, th that's where you can truly maximize the tax code. What we're often saying is we want to build wealth and create passive income outside of Wall Street. And this is, is one way that somebody could easily do it. Absolutely. And uh, I know that we've got some videos that we'll share in the links in the show notes that, uh, that talk about, uh, it's called the and asset. And it illustrates exactly what you just talked about is using cash value, the privately placed insurance policy as a store for wealth. And then also what it looks like when you utilize, you know, turnkey properties, such as what Liz is going to be talking about and kind of where we end up. So I think that'll be a good piece to add. And uh, for anybody that's listening, um, I don't want to ruin it, but uh, I really liked what Liz had in there where she talks about the different perspective that experienced investors have and what they're focused on as opposed to what the new investors or novice investor is focused on when they start looking at some of these properties. So uh, make sure you listen for that great little piece in there and uh, yeah, enjoy this interview. One thing I would like to add before we turn it over to Liz is if you're interested on in creating some passive income through Liz, her number is going to be in the show notes. But if you want to see, so I'd mentioned about taking advantage of the tax code and kind of creating a policy 
that you can use to buy real estate. And in the show notes will be a link where you could where you can schedule a 15 minute call with Cameron or I. And we're kind of just see if we are a good fit or if, or if this is something for you. So do take a look in the show notes for that as well. Welcome to the Infinite Wealth Podcast. I'm Cameron Christensen along with our co-host Anthony Faso. Anthony, welcome. How are you today? I'm doing good. I'm really excited for our podcast today. We've talked a lot about creating passive income and there are a lot of ways to do that. And real estate to me is one of my favorites, but I am no, I'm no handyman as you know, Cameron. Okay. I know. Fixing things or really, and I'm too much of a softy. If I was a landlord and somebody gave me some story, I'm just, okay, no problem. You know, we're just paying me next month. Okay. Just pay me next month. I, I just can't do it. And so kind of what we're going to talk about today is turnkey real estate, which I think is going to solve some of those issues. If somebody is hesitant to take their first step into real estate, or maybe even if they are doing real estate, but they, they want to diversify and looking for some other options. Absolutely. Welcome. And uh, I want to welcome Liz Nallen, Director of Sales and Marketing for Mid-South Home Buyers. Welcome, Liz. Uh, thank you so much, Cameron and Anthony. It's great to be here. Absolutely. Thanks for joining us. So if you could, uh, Liz, if you, could you start off kind of telling our, our listeners, kind of give us a general definition of what turnkey real estate actually is? Uh, great, great question. Um, and uh, it's a broadly used term. Uh, and so it's good for your listeners to, to really know what it should mean. Um, uh, turnkey real estate is going to give the end investor buyer the benefits of uh, the amazing benefits of real estate, really, as you guys know, I'm sure real estate's created more millionaires in America than any other industry yet. Um, but there's a lot of nuances to renovation. Uh, Anthony, as you said, there are tons of nuances to uh, resident management, tenant management. Um, and so you can um, lose a lot of money and spend a lot of wheels uh, getting your education on, uh, trying to do it by hand um, yourself. Um, and an industry that has kind of risen up in the last little bit, uh, Mid-South Homebuyers is the, where I work, is the oldest operating turnkey company in the U.S., um, the turnkey industry that has risen up essentially lets investors in um, often co expensive coastal markets, um, New York, California, um, in my case, we work with uh, investors in 17 different countries, uh, live where they want to live and then plug into some of the real estate advantages that are in markets like my own, which happens to be Memphis, Tennessee. Um, so, so turnkey is going to be a fully set up seller of real estate that has property management of that home in-house under the same roof. It's going to be a one-stop shop for, uh, you know, sort of typically busy investors. My, my clients are often, you know, heart surgeons, pilots, um, folks that uh, don't need to be spending time working out the mechanics themselves. Um, in, in the example with Mid-South, um, everyone here is born and raised in Memphis, uh, been doing this for almost 17 years, and the infrastructure is in place um, from a renovation standpoint and a property management uh, standpoint, and most importantly, the expertise um, is, is already garnered, if you will. Um, and, th and that's what folks want to look for, is uh, uh, somebody that's been doing it for a very long time, knows the market really, really well, knows the neighborhoods like the back of their hand, uh, subtle things like knowing the best brand of paint that's going to last for the longest or the brand of ceiling fan or lock. Um, so the physical condition of the house is supporting the return on investment and not detracting it with uh, maintenance and repairs, you know, kind of eating away at your return and at the, the in happiness of the renter, um, if you will. Uh, and that, that outfit should have, um, you know, be able to provide you with great references. That outfit should have a history that they can speak to so you know you're investing in a safe way. They should be setting the rents properly for you. Um, because the rents in, in, in the markets where cash flows are uh, positive are, tend to be a lot lower than what investors are used to. Um, so yeah, a one-stop shop for being a landlord would be the much shorter summation of turnkey. So Liz, so then you guys 
find a property, rehab it, find a tenant, and then lease it? Or is it, is it leased before it's sold? Or how does, what happens first? Yeah, and you pretty much want that to be the case. Holding costs on a vacant property um, can kind of also eat into that return. Um, folks that are, are looking to do this should be looking with a company that can tell them that that property is going to be occupied really shortly after it closed and certainly renovated before close. Um, with uh, speaking to our, my personal experience, uh, you know, if you have your rents priced right, you're going to have a ton of rental demand. And if the renovation is nice enough, that house should fly off the shelf as far as getting a highly qualified renter in that door to begin paying you rent via the property management company. Um, for my investors, they're closing on a fully renovated house, um, almost always with a new renter already in the home paying rent at the beginning of a 12 month lease. Um, uh, and with a move in date that's going to be within two to three weeks of the close date uh, in both directions, often um, before. Liz, how would you define fully renovated? That's a great question. Um, your biggest expenses on a home are the roof, the central heating and air system, and the water heater. Um, with HVAC, you know, obviously covering your furnace, your A coil, um, you know these 12 to $14,000 systems sometimes um, that when they pop up, if you will, can wipe out a few years of income off of that rental property. Um, and so, you know, I guess you, the, the big categories are going to be a cosmetic renovation, which is much easier to do, uh, costs a lot less money for the person doing it. Um, but ultimately is going to leave a bit of deferred maintenance uh, on the table or in the deal, if you will. And that's your, your typical paint and a light fixture, sometimes called lipstick on a pig. Um, but, you know, uh, with those new systems, with those major systems being new, you can really calculate out a certain ret uh, return for a 10 or 12 year hold because those, uh, you know, a brand new roof has a very long life ahead of it, um, probably through the eventual resell of the property, as does those central heating and air systems and the water heater. Um, but that, of course, needs to be in addition to, uh, you know, updated kitchens, updated bathrooms, updated electrical, updated plumbing, uh, a balance of things. With us, with our renovation, every dollar we spend is either to defer maintenance for the purchasing investor or to attract another dollar in rent. So you've got stuff like shutters and landscaping that we do every time or new kitchen cabinets. Um, that's going to help uh, attract the most renters. And then there's stuff like the new roof and the new central heating and air that's about deferring maintenance. Um, and so it, pretty, it needs to be pretty stem to stern to be called a total renovation. Um, it's fine if a, someone wants to walk into a deal with aging roof and aging components and stuff like that just it's a deal that you would need to be a lot more careful about a, a renter doesn't care how old the hot water heater is as long as the water is hot and the renter doesn't care how old the roof is if the roof isn't leaking and so a deal could look good at the first glance as far as what the purchase price is in relationship to the rent and what that initial monthly income is but what's not reflected in that and what people need to be aware of is is those costs that may be barreling towards them. Okay. Liz, on the, so, so you kind of talked about fully renovated properties. So the, kind of on the front end again is, are you guys looking for a house that needs to be fully renovated? What type of, uh, what type of criteria are you looking for when you're looking for properties? So great question. So our goal as a company is to provide the highest monthly cash flow to the purchasing investor, the highest margin between the rent and what that investor's carrying costs on the home be, whether they've gotten a simple mortgage on it as most people do, or some people pay cash. Um, to do that, you have to have, um, on the one hand, an area with low purchase prices and low property taxes, and on the other hand, a safe neighborhood that can attract a quality, stable tenant. Um, so that's that's what we're looking for on the, the broader scale. And then within that, um, because the business model is to put out houses that are all new, it does tend to make sense for us to pick up um, a, a house that's been neglected that that is priced lower. We, we will often um, double what we paid uh, for a house and what we put into it in the renovation to make it all new. But with 
Terry's personal properties and in our 17 years of business, we've just found it the best way to offer up a property that's going to work for somebody, not just for the first five years, but for the next 15. Um, so yeah, you just have cycle of life that can kind of um, bring a house into that condition while it's still in a, a, a sort of safe, stable neighborhood. They're blue collar working class neighborhoods in, in our market that tends to produce the highest returns. Um, and you can have situations where um, it's an investor that owns a lot of properties that is maybe completely living off of the income from those houses uh, and maybe just doing band-aid repairs as they're in their later years. And then that property eventually kind of hits the market in a slightly distressed condition. Uh, you could have another version of say an older person living on a fixed income in the house, also only making limited kind of band-aid style repairs that perhaps eventually passes on and you have, you know, six kids in six different states. Um, that are, you know, don't want anything to do with the property, really. Uh, and that's, that's what the turnkey, that's a lot of the blood, sweat, and tears that the turnkey provider is doing for the purchasing investor in that they're knowing what neighborhoods are what and knowing how to find those deals and also sift through the majority of properties out there for sale that aren't good candidates for this. What's, uh, th thanks, Liz. What's, uh, what, what markets and what neighborhoods are you guys uh, operating in now? So uh, we're primarily based out of Memphis, which is where we've been operating for, for 17 plus years. We search the whole Memphis area for houses where the numbers make sense. Um, and uh, our, our, the breadth of our properties is pretty wide. Um, it, but you, we have a cluster sort of in North Memphis, um, some in Midtown Memphis, and um, also down south. Um, so pretty broad area. Um, Memphis itself is a kind of the stars just aligned here for high income producing rental property. Um, the construction style is um, brick ranch houses, no basements to mess with, um, hip roofs, which means sort of not a lot of wood that has to be scraped and painted on the home. Um, the landlord tenant law in Tennessee is fantastic. There's no income tax in Tennessee as well. Um, and very importantly, 53% of the Memphis population rents. Um, that's so unusual. It puts us in the 98th percentile for the nation. Um, the re one of the reasons we are the oldest operating turnkey company in the U.S. is that the returns that Memphis has to offer have been here for years and years and years. Uh, it's just that the secret's gotten out a little bit more. Yeah. Um, the price to rent ratios um, – that are here have been here for a long time and it's because our economic drivers um, here are distribution and transportation. Um, we have the second busiest cargo airport in the world. Um, that's because FedEx is internationally headquartered here. We have Nike's largest North American distribution facility. It's the size of 42 football fields. It's got 33 miles of conveyor belts in it. Um, and so uh, there's tons of jobs here loading barges that are going up and down the Mississippi, loading semi-trucks, Highway 40 runs coast to coast here, loading planes. And as an investor myself with my own portfolio, um, I really like that because um, it feels to me, as, uh, not a, I'm not an economist, but like a very stable economic driver. Um, so for example, 200 years ago, um, before the Civil War, all cotton grown in the U.S. came through Memphis, Tennessee. And Today, all cotton grown in the U.S. comes through Memphis, Tennessee. Uh, yeah. Our economy is very much driven by our geography. And so these industries that are employing um, our rentals, our, our renters and, you know, in factories and um, in some labor jobs and stuff like that, uh, you know, FedEx can't get a tax incentive and pick up and move to Miami um, and so on. Uh, the, it was the Nike distribution facility, uh, you know, they're, it's the largest on the continent. They're going up to Canada. They were going down to Mexico. You, you can't relocate that to Portland and, and have, have the distribution work the same way. Um, so, so that's kind of a little bit about some of the numbers that, that make Memphis such a hotbed for this in the first place. Perfect. And yeah, Liz, uh, speaking about numbers is Anthony and I are looking at Las Vegas. I was going to ask you kind of about the, 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 average home price out there is because uh, here in Las Vegas, I think it's 300,000 plus. What type of yeah. home prices are you, are you typically looking at for the turnkey properties that you get? <laughs> so Memphis is 
outrageously affordable, especially for the cultural bang you can for your buck that you can get here. I love living here, uh, as does all of my a lot of my friends, of course. Um, and on the one hand, we are the the 22nd biggest city in the country, kind of give or take, depending on on the stats, the list you're looking at uh, uses. We get major con. Uh, you know, major concerts, we've got NBA sports teams, you know, 600,000 people or something insane a year visit Graceland. It's the second visited most house uh, in the nation after the White House. And at the same time, the cost of living here is so low. Um, the median home price for the greater Memphis area is $129,000. And the median home price for Memphis proper is 89,000. Um, that's not our inventory. That's just Memphis as a whole. Um, my, my, I, I feel you on those Las Vegas numbers. And uh, my old running joke is that is that 90% of my life is explaining what a $60,000 house is to Californians and, and New Yorkers and, uh, and the like. And um, one of the reasons I love Memphis is that the cost of living here is so affordable. So our properties and our sweet spot for having a, a safe, quiet, stable neighborhood that can attract a quality tenant with choices and options about where they live, um, you know, but also kind of hit those metrics for a really good income stream um, is between 60, 59,000 to 95,000 is, is our sweet spot uh, for those investment properties. And they'll have rents correlated of you know, on the lowest end, maybe 695 a month up to 995 a month. So it's kind of a narrow niche. You're talking about a $35,000 swing from our cheapest property to our most expensive property and about a $350 swing, you know, from the cheapest rent to the most expensive rent. Um, and it just works like gangbusters. And then the fact that they are financeable at those super affordable price points, meaning yeah. that you can walk up and only put 20% down on that $60,000 house, meaning you're buying fully renovated real estate in a, in a, in a quiet, peaceful neighborhood for $12,000 down uh, before your closing costs is is just wild. I mean, it's the equivalent of a, of a used car, <laughs> um, but it's a beautiful brick house. And so it's, it's what's cool about Memphis, um, you know, uh, Memphis is not particularly known as a strong appreciation town. We're kind of slow and steady on that. We don't, you know, Las Vegas is a great example as well. In contrast, we have really big jumps in value year over year mm -hmm. and, and maybe negative cash flow. But there are talking heads that point to uh, the great quality of life you can get living here because of that. And so um, I, that's what I think is a person that maybe one day Memphis could have greater appreciation than we see, even though from an investment standpoint, I would always tell people to just expect low and slow and the slow and steady town we've already always been. Um, but you can have a great quality of life here. And we, we've made lists like best place for a startup, uh, best place for millennials, stuff like that because of some of these things I've been talking about. Liz, you got me wanting to move to Memphis. <laughs> <laughs> it's fun. We'll go get some barbecue and and and, and catch some good shows. So <laughs> let's do it. Is uh, one of the things that you kind of mentioned uh, early on when you started talking is you mentioned that you work with investors in seventeen different countries. Did I hear that correctly? Yes, absolutely. Yeah, it's it's pretty cool. We get to work with some neat folks in all fifty states. So. Uh, that's, yeah, that's, where, that's, where I, that's where I was going next is that, um, right, we work with uh, investors and a lot of our clients uh, are here locally. And so if you were to kind of talk to somebody, maybe a new investor uh, that might have a concern about owning property, you know, across the country, um, how, how would you address that? Or do you typically address that with them? You know, um, it's a good question. Um, it's one of those things I think, the more you research us, the more you'll like us. Um, and, and I think research is what would let a person sort of sleep at night, if you will, and feel safe, at, you know, um, investing out of state. Um, from my investors that are in um, Tokyo or Sydney or New York or California uh, or Las Vegas, the numbers don't tend to make sense in their own backyards and they want to put their money to work in real estate. Um, and so just vetting, you know, um, like we have an A, A plus rating with the Better Business Bureau, asking for references, um, 
on my end, I love it when people come to town and we're not as far from Vegas as a lot of my clients uh, might be. And uh, about 95% of my investors um, have never set foot in Memphis. Uh, we're set up for everybody to do this right from their living room. Um, and lots of folks do, but um, for those that are kind of the touch it, smell it, see it kind of folks, I would encourage them to reach out to me and fly down to Memphis if you feel like it. It's very likely a tax write-off for you, most probably. Uh, I can say that for sure for every person, but um, it, it is a fun town. And well, I will, you know, instead of trying to describe our beautiful little neighborhoods, I can just stand in the front yard with you. So um, I okay, think that would be cool. the, the final stop for just to have feeling a peaceful heart uh, on investing out of state, which I understand why it would make people nervous. Everybody works hard for their money. They want to put it in the right place. Absolutely. Awesome. Is uh one of the things that kind of Anthony and I talk about is kind of investing out of state or, or finding companies that have certain processes in place. And from yeah. the research and from the clients that I know that work with you guys, you guys have processes in place from the acquisition that you've kind of touched on all the way to the back end yep. to kind of the property management, right? Would you mind kind of talking a little bit more maybe about that property management? I see that being a, a huge kind of incentive or a, a huge, um, advantage that Mid-South has over a lot of people? Absolutely. A um, couple different things to unpack there. That's, uh, so much great stuff in that, in that question. Uh, I'll start with property management and its importance and then back into some of the systems that we use cool. uniquely for that. Um, property management is everything. It is where the rubber meets the road. Um, Terry, the owner of Mid-South, I've heard him say it a million times, but you can manage a marginal deal to success and you can manage a good deal into the ground. And, and I work with investors that um, are renting in their expensive markets and I'm helping them buy literally their first house in life. Uh, I'm also working with investors that are buying their 50th house in life. And there's uh, no difference on our end between them, but the only difference I can always perceive is that the more experienced the investor, the more they are zoomed in on the property management, and that's where their focus is, and that's where I'm answering the questions. The less experienced the investor, and it, every one of us is a first-timer at some point, but they rather naturally being out, newer to the industry are more focused on the numbers of the house, and they sort of more uh, picture that, that return just manifesting and that rent just manifesting, and it's a bit far from the truth um, because you have to do a lot of things right and in the right order and with the right staff um, and efficiently to make it actually all pan out the way the calculator is showing you. Um, on the system side, as we've had these decades to evolve, uh, stub our toes sometimes and figure out the right way to do things, the whole we are our whole company is run on a check a system of checks and balances a bit, but um, little examples that come to my mind. Um, Terry, the owner of the company, walks every single house we put out twice. Um, once when we buy the property, and again after the renovation. Um, it is his personal mandate that we don't put out a property he would not proudly own in his own portfolio. Um, he keeps houses every single year because these things are genuinely valuable money makers. I keep houses every single year. I'd keep them all if I could. Um, and and so so there's that that hands onness. He's um, not not uh, sitting back, you know, in some other state, um, not watching it. On the property management side, um, the evolution there from um, doing a tri-merge credit check, which means we're paying to check all three bureaus um, with the renter to prior landlord verification. You know, a lot of folks, a lot of property management companies would take a renter if they had two years good references from a landlord they'd lived with a year ago but had been staying with a family member for the last year. We would actually tell that person to come back when they had immediate landlord history. So there's all of these nuances that are uh, – brought into the stuff that makes us efficient. Um, we get a weekly scorecard as a company for how many days we're averaging between move-in and move-out. Um, days between move-in and move-out are lost rent days, and they are days that you have the property and you're, of course, still carrying your taxes and insurance and anything else, but there's not that income coming in. So it's something, it's a number you want to be as low as possible. 
Um, and for anyone that has done uh, some of the blood, sweat, and tears that go into property management themselves, they know that, um, you know, renters, they don't move in the day they call. They don't move in the day they tour. They don't move in the day they apply. They don't move a week and a half later when you call them and tell them they're approved. Um, they typically have to give 30 days notice at their prior landlords. You also had to have had that house zipped up with a little bit of fresh touch-up paint from the last renter and so on for it to look good when they toured it. Um, we average something along the lines of 28.67 days um, between move in and move out. If that was our statistic for taking a deposit, it would frankly be very good and quite competitive within the industry. Um, but for us, that's between move in and move out. And you can have some seasonal variations a little bit. Nobody moves the last two weeks of December unless they're in, a dis you know, in distress. Uh, a, a property tucked away in a cul-de-sac may take an extra week to rent because nobody drives by the front sign, but Mrs. Smith's going to stay an extra two years because her kids can play in front of the house safely. Um, but with tiny, within Tiny Swings, we're really, really dialed in on that. Um, and that, that's just some of our our in-house uh, systems and efficiencies. We have an internal software that we've developed for years that's just in-house with us. And the system is so smart that if a renter gives notice to vacate to my property management company, he, my property manager clicks one box in our computer system and all these balls drop in all these different people's courts without any human um, memory having to happen. Um, if it's the system knows what time of year it is, and if it's the summertime, that house is going to appear on our yard guys list every two weeks until he, until someone clicks in the system that we've taken a deposit. That one click also made that house appear on our rovers, which is a, a position we have in our company. A rover just goes around and you're dropping signs and pulling signs and all that other stuff, taking photos. The house is automatically going to appear on the rovers list the next day to put signs in the yard. And so I, I don't mean to bore anybody with the minutia, um, but it's just little ways of getting all the wheels and the machine dialed in together so that this stuff can happen efficiently. Um, another phenomenon that can kind of happen is property management companies not wanting to staff year round for seasonal swings in property management. Um, we have a lifetime occupancy guarantee that's written into our management agreement that says if your property were ever vacant for more than 90 days, we would start paying you rent, full rent, not your mortgage or anything else, full rent from the 91st day on until we found you a renter. Um, I'm grateful to say we've never spent a penny on that. Um, that's because our properties don't stay vacant that long. Um, but to back up to my example on being staffed correctly, um, a property management company managing, let's say 300 houses, uh, 400 houses, may have five move outs in December and 11 move outs in February and 42 move outs in April. Um, and when that happens, somebody's house goes to the back of the line as far as, far as getting, you know, some of those paint touch-ups or getting ready for re rent And unfortunately, something I will hear from folks that have, have been doing this with other people and are first coming to me that, you know, it's as simple, it took them seven weeks to get my property zipped up and ready for re-rent, and it took them another seven weeks to get uh, an approved tenant moved into the home. Um, and it's a big two months of, of carrying costs is no joke, you know. Yeah. And so it's not even that they're high, they're small in a little $60,000 house, but it's just about getting the return you expected. Hey, Liz, I want to reiterate, I just want to, you said something that I thought was very crucial, and I've heard you say it before, so we've talked a couple times, but mm -hmm. what you're saying is that if a, if a house is unrented for 90 days, because probably one of the biggest downsides of real estate is, is going to be vacancy. Mm -hmm. But if a house is vacant for over 90 days, you guys will, you guys will pay the market rent. Yes until we get a person in there at that rent. And it's, we've never had cool. to do it, but we would, it's in writing. And there's no, there's no time limit on that. That's not like, oh, for the first year, though, gosh, if anyone was seeing that in the first year, that'd be awful. But uh, uh, it, it's literally, it's just, it's simply written into our management agreement. So that's in place 10 years after you purchase, as long as we are the managers of your property, um, that is our guarantee 
uh, to the investor. So, okay, Liz, and it, is, it is unparalleled. You know. Yeah, it, yeah, I've I, I haven't heard of that. Liz, can you explain maybe some some pros and cons of using uh, a turnkey provider as opposed to buying it and managing it yourself? Let's see. Um, they're 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 significant. Um, Terry, the owner of Mid South, and I've referred to before here, will tell you that he worked for free for the first three years of this business, um, figuring out the right neighborhoods to buy in, figuring out, uh, uh, as you said, he, uh, uh, Cameron earlier, or I'm sorry, it was Anthony, uh, getting a property manager in place that was a little tougher than him. Uh, he's just like you on that. Um, and, and getting all of those parts assembled, finding reliable contractors that will work for you for a fair price, that are honest, that show up. It is, it is harder than you would think to assemble a team to do the kind of touch-ups on the house to, you know, to make that, to buy in the right neighborhood. Um, it's a runway. There's, there's lost money that if you are wanting to really learn how to work and have a J-O-B in real estate, that you could consider it an investment in tuition as far as the money you may lose spending a couple years and, and maybe having a few deals go south or just break even um, as you try to learn how to do it yourself. Um, and for those that are considering changing their current career to have a career, a full-time career in real estate, but it's a job they're waking up for, um, that might be the best option for them to get out there and learn how to do it. Um, for someone that is maybe wanting to get out of the rat race, but not to go work in real estate, but to get out of the rat race to go spend time with their family and their loved ones and have financial freedom. Those person, those people may as well plug into someone that's already done all of the work of figuring out how to do that and get it right. Um, very uniquely with Mid-South, but it doesn't apply to turnkey on the whole. Um, no one could recreate the houses that we sell for less money. Um, our very, very slim profit margins come out of the fact that we can do a $30,000 renovation for $27,000 uh, or $25,000. Um, if there's a house here in Memphis that Mid-South is selling for $84,000 and I wanted to try to buy the house around the corner from it that is unrenovated and put some money into it, put some new stuff in it, I would end up with $86,000 in it and having lost two months of my life to a full-time job just because I'm paying one time for cabinets and you know, one time for what have you, right? Um, let alone, that's assuming I, I found the right neighborhood, I hired the right contractors, and I had my groove on with property management and could put the right tenant in there. Um, most people don't do the level of re recreation, uh, of renovation that we do, where maybe uh, it could possibly be recreated and save someone a few thousand dollars if they wanted to do a lot of work and were okay with kind of having some wild cards in there if that makes sense. Okay. Liz, if you could, um, man, there's a lot of really good information here. Is, could you kind of talk to us or, <laughs> or make a, a comment about the volume of houses that you guys have been doing or expect to do um, as far as the renovating the acquisition and also offering to clients? Sure. Um, we uh, bought, renovated, and sold 427 houses last year. Uh, in Memphis, I think we'll do another 440 this year, probably if I had to guess from looking at my 2019 numbers so far. Um, it's a, a great volume in one sense and that there's no inventory issues. I'm getting four to nine new investment properties um, a week to turn around and offer to my wait list. We do still, despite that great clip of inventory, have a wait list for the property. It's entirely fueled by two, the two scales of supply and demand. And it's on the demand side, it's just that we've been operating for 17 years, setting inv investors up with real estate that works really well for them. So they come back over and over and refer family and friends um, the way it should be if you've been offering up something that helps people make money for a very long time. 
um, and the other scale of the supply and demand is that we're really choosy about the properties we put out. Put out. Um, 400 is a lot, but from a financial standpoint, we have plenty of money to buy houses, and there's certainly more than 400 houses for sale in Memphis, even just right now as we speak. Um, we pass and pass and pass on any property that doesn't fit our perfectionist sort of model. Um, we will pass on a property just because there are too many for rent signs in the neighborhood. Uh, even if it met our metrics by every, every other standard, um, that would be enough to make us not make an offer on that property, let alone the more obvious stuff like under a flight path or next to a corner store that gets a lot of foot traffic or you know stuff like that. Um, we will evaluate about 25 properties for every one that we put an offer in on, and we don't get every property we put an offer in on. And so they become very interchangeable by the time they've jumped through our 42 hoops. Um, you can look at my current houses, even though they're under contract to investors at the top of the wait list at midsouthhomebuyers.com. Um, under the available properties tab, and um, you just, it's almost boring. <laughs> you just see the same beautiful new kitchen over and over again, the same bathroom over and over again, the same kind of three bedroom brick ranch um, over and over again. And if I could send you drone shots of the neighborhoods, they all look and feel about the same to kind of whether they're in North Memphis or South Memphis or what have you, because they're hitting from a price point in the same kind of sweet spot that we like to operate in. I'm on your website right now, Liz, and uh, yeah, you're right. Like even the, I mean, the hardware looks similar too. Yeah, yes. It makes us very efficient on the property management side as well. Um, so my, my biggest fans, my investors that have only ever worked with us love us, but my, my rabid fans are my investors that have bought properties from other turnkey providers or, or I've done a little bit of this themselves and um, we can do almost same day maintenance service uh, eventually when the house does need a little repair here and there. We have a, you know, that same giant warehouse I've spoken of before and it's got every single, you know, it's the same oil rubbed bronze toilet paper holder <laughs> in every mid-south bathroom, you know, uh, the same thermostat, the same water heater. When we do have to make repairs, we can make them super fast, almost same day. And very importantly, you're not paying a technician to wait in line for a home in Home Depot for a part. Um, it's part of why it's one reason I can say that our average renter stays three and a half years. Um, industry average for a rental stay is two years, um, and we're almost double that. The numbers in Memphis are so awesome that unfortunately there is a lot of sloppy long distance landlording going on, um, sloppy kind of semi-permanent turnkey companies that may open and then shutter a few years later and a few things like that. And um, we ask every renter that comes to us um, why they're leaving their prior landlord. And the answer over and over and over again is my landlord won't fix anything. Um, and so one reason we have a lot of rental lo renter loyalty and long-term folks is A, stuff's not breaking very often, but B, when stuff does need touch-ups as it always does in life, um, we zip out there really quickly with a friendly guy that's in there for 15 minutes and you're back up and running. I, I, I will say this, thank you for that. Is, uh, and I'm looking at the website now and uh, just a, a, a ton of really good information from the available properties the, the guarantee that you mentioned before, the lifetime occupancy guarantee, that 90-day one, that's just one of four or five guarantees that you guys have that I can see from here. And then uh, you've yes, got a really, sir. Thank you. Yeah, then you got a really good piece on uh, due diligence. So, man, if anybody's listening right now, make sure you go check out Mid-South Home Buyers just for just a, a ton of really good information. Oh, and I'm glad you reminded me on that due diligence section. We wrote that to help uh, – investors invest in any market. It does not have to be with us by any means. And that there's a due diligence report you can download that has uh, 19 questions to ask any turnkey provider um, that can help you snake out some, anybody that might have overpriced rents or you know different things like that. Um, and yeah, thank you for the kind words. The website is my baby and I <laughs> love it. I put everything I can think of that might help someone understand what we do up there. Um, and it's a full course in this kind of A to Z, um, even if you are maybe thinking about doing this in your own market or something else. Liz, 
what do you what should an investor be looking for when when they're looking to buy a rental property? I think the most important thing for an out of state investor particularly is mm -hmm. to make sure well there's a lot of important things. <laughs> um, making sure your market rent is set appropriately so that there will be a lot of renter interest in the property, um, a lot of applicants for the manager to choose from, and that the renter will be happy in the home and feel like they're getting a really good deal. Um, there's a unfortunate correlation with how much a turnkey provider can sell a house for that it, this is a direct correlation to how much it can rent for. Maybe unfortunate is not right, the right word, that's natural, but um, if, if someone can say that a property rents for $25 more, they can sell it for $4,000 more, and the in buyer's numbers on the calculator, if you will, look the same. Um, $4,000 in purchase price spread out across a 30-year fixed mortgage is going to basically bump up your mortgage $25 a month. So then all someone that sells rental property has to do is get that house to rent for $975 instead of $950, and then they can sell it for $4,000 more. Um, $25 bucks a month may not be a ton to you or I, but it, it, it is to a renter. And even if it's only a little bit, if you and I are looking at um, a bottle of wine and one, it's the exact same bottle of wine and one costs $5 more than the other, we're still going to go for the cheaper one, even if we're Bill Gates. Uh, and so it's about providing that value. And another thing, you know, an experienced investor, investor will say is that a three-year renter stay at 750 makes you so much more money than a one-year stay at 775 that $25 a month difference is was that 240 bucks a month um, I'm sorry a year you know that to if you look at that and then a vacancy at the 13th month a longer stay at a slightly lower rent is a lot more profitable than dealing with the costs and associated with turnover, vacancy, cost to refill the property, getting started over with the new tenant. Um, and so the system of offering slightly under market rent actually means that we have to sell the houses for just a little bit less because the price and the rent have to make sense together and offer a, an in return for an investor. Um, but so that's the first thing I would ha suggest someone make sure is really dialed in and that there's no fluff, if you will, in what that rental rate might be set at, particularly since most of the markets that lend themselves to this type of investment tend to be a lot more affordable than where the purchasing investor is coming from. It can be very hard for someone in Las Vegas, New York, or California to see or sense that 750 is too much for a property and it should be 725 because that rent rate doesn't even exist in their market. Um, so kind of having people with integrity that are wanting to work with you, not just on this purchase, but on all the future ones and with your family and friends and want you to be happy way down the line. And that's the same reason I think the very next step is in-house property management being um, a must. Um, the classic story that you hear from people that purchased from separate providers versus property management is I was told it rented for 850 and there was no deferred maintenance. The property management company that is not a, that, you know, you referred me to them, uh, you know, but they're not, they're not actually working for you and they're not actually owned by you um, is telling me that the reason it's been vacant for eight weeks is that we need to drop the rent by 40 bucks. You drop the rent by 40 bucks, you get a person in there and then there's a repair bill every month, but you were told the house was in good condition. Um, well, your accountability is not in the same place, and the seller points at the property management company, and the property management company points at the seller, and meanwhile, you're thousands of miles away. Um, when all of that is under one roof, um, your accountability is all in one place, and, you know, it's just a good alignment of interests. Lizzo, what do your typical clients look like? Oh, man, I got them all. Um, <laughs> I work with um, super, super experienced real estate investors that own 600 plus 
units and are busy and their day job is buying multi-million dollar apartment complexes and they just uh, put these get these little houses from me like they're it's a CD you know 401k or something um, I work with investors that are acquiring their very first property in life because they're currently renting in Manhattan or Santa Monica and their local real estate market is uh, doesn't make sense for them um, and so I welcome folks of all stripes I, I think my youngest investor is probably 22 and my oldest is probably 65 or 68 uh, and so um, you know we're putting out the same great thing that works and or, you know we want to help out anybody that thinks we're a fit for them Liz you had uh, you know there's been a lot of people who have made a lot of money in real estate, particularly the last 10 years. And part of it, I, I think they're, they bought it real low and it, it was, it was really easy to, mm -hmm. to make money. Uh, or, but I've been telling, we've been telling our clients winter's coming. Like there's, <laughs> there's going to be a recession. Nobody knows exactly yeah. when, but it's, it's happening soon. Um, so, but you guys have, were, you guys started doing business before the Great Recession. So how did, how did you manage that time period? Such an important thing. And we're, I'm so grateful we were able to speak to that. We just happened to have been in business since yeah. 2002. And so we, we were pre-bubble, we were through the bubble, we were through the crash. Um, I came to Mid-South personally in 09. And actually, the, the, the tectonic plates, if you were still, were still shifting a little bit, even at that mm -hmm. point, actually. I, yeah. We were still selling houses. We had a little bit of business of selling houses to owner-occupants when I first got there. And it dried up within my, lap, my first six months with the company because uh, the tide had just receded completely. And, and from the days of a first-time home buyer being able to fog a mirror and thus get a loan, uh, it became extremely qual hard to qualify. And... Uh, uh, and so, so lots of navigation. We did really well, and our investors did really well through the whole thing. Um, Terry, the owner, has never had a foreclosure in his multi-decade real estate career. None of our investors have ever lost a property to the bank. And in fact, it's much really better than that, which is just that in that time, we did not see any downward shift in rents. Values shifted down, of course, though not nearly as dramatically as they did in other parts of the country. But the beautiful part about buy and hold investment is you get a lot more immune to what the outside world is doing uh, for a couple of different reasons. Um, a bad economy creates renters more than anything. So, you know, we in the nation did not see a spike in the homeless population when that happened, what, when the Great Recession happened. What we saw was a huge migration of homeowners into the rental market, and it propped up rental demand. Um, so, you know, uh, it's, a lot, it's, it's a bit harder for someone to save up their down payment to become an owner-occupant. It's a little bit easier for them to just miss a cell phone bill that dings their credit a little bit, but they're still – great people keeping a roof over their head. And for my investors that brought from us in 07 and 08 mm -hmm. uh, at the height of the market, at that time we were selling a fully renovated home that rented for six seventy five a month for $55,000. That investor that bought, you know, and m most anyone that bought real estate in America in 2006 or 2007 typically had enormous regrets about it. And, uh, yeah. You know, it was just a, a terrible experience for them. Anybody that bought from Mid South in 06 and 07 was a buying to hold it for a minimum of a 10 or 15 year hold anyway, and never had any intention of, you know, selling it within one to two to three years. Um, they got the exact income that they had signed up for. They didn't have they didn't have the crystal ball, and it was okay that they didn't have the crystal ball. Um, they were on a fixed mortgage payment even then we were nobody was doing adjustable rate stuff for this kind of housing mm -hmm. um it, it stayed fixed the rent stayed and they got the exact you know 300 bucks a month that they had signed up for um i as i've mentioned by my, my investment properties 
from the company myself, and I was thinking about the same thing you guys asked. This was a couple years ago, and I, I did the math, and if I had been that buyer in 2007, as of today, I, I would have made, I, I think my numbers were about, it was about $45,000 in gross cash flow. Um, it would have been about $15,000 in equity pay down, and that would all be because I would have written a check in 07 for a little more than $12,000 for that down payment. And if you gave me a time travel ticket right now today to go back and buy that house and swap it for the last 14 years of cash flow or 10, when it was 19, <laughs> uh, uh, 12 years of cash flow, I would do it in a heartbeat. It means the world to me personally um, as an investor buyer that if you gave me a time travel ticket today, I would travel back in time and buy from us in 07. If you let me pick, I would buy from us in 09 when stuff was about <laughs> 10 grand cheaper. Sure. <laughs> you know, don't get me wrong. If you said 07 or 09, I'll take 09. But barring that, because there's a huge cost to just sitting on your money trying to wait for the crash too. You know, everyone's trying to figure it out. And so, um, I move forward and buy my investment properties from the company once uh, about once a year is what I can personally afford to do. Um, and with our wait times, it's <laughs> right. And so um, I feel confident with it and I sleep super well at night because I know a I'm buying it to hold it for 10 or 15 years minimum. And B I don't think that if we have great, you know, the great recession, number two, um, rents didn't fall last time. And I would think that stuff is in place. So it would be the same. Liz, that's great. And in summary, and this kind of correlates when we tell people when they're buying real estate is to buy it for cash flow. Mm -hmm. and just like you Absolutely. said, when there is a dip in the economy, everybody kind of goes down a level. So people are going to need to be renting homes. And as long as you're cash flowing, the, the appreciation is, is just ice on the cake. We want to buy Absolutely. properties that are going to cash flow. You know, it's a great reason to already have your rents be slightly under market and not puffed up because if there was an impact within Memphis, let's say, um, and you have a slightly higher incidence of um, people cohabitating when they otherwise would have lived separately, right, because the economy is a little bit down and stuff like that frankly, it's the other property management companies that would feel the pain first because we are still the most competitive product on the in rental market. So, you know, if you guys know the story about the bear in the woods and the two guys um, and the guy said, uh, how, how are we going to outrun this bear? And the other guy says, I don't have to outrun the bear. I just have to outrun you. Uh, yeah. We just kind of have to outrun the other guy. Um, and so even if you which is not something we saw last time, but even if there was a reduction in rental demand, it would hurt other people before it would hurt us. And that would be true for anyone that was dialed in to renter value um, and having a slightly nicer place for a little bit less money. Um, our investors could afford, and no one's ever done this and we've never seen it, but our investors could afford to drop their rents by 50 bucks and still be cash flow positive. And we've never seen rents go backwards. So you've got some layers of, you know, a rising tide lifts and lowers all boats, mm -hmm. but you've got some layers of protection in there if you buy right and you're working with the right people. Liz, I got I to gotta say that I am very impressed with your depth of knowledge and the breadth of Aww. knowledge you have on this subject. I mean, you would. Thank you. Yeah, absolutely. Very impressive. But uh, I will say this as we kind of wrap it up is if there is a real estate investor that's listening and wants to move forward, what would their next step be, especially specifically kind of with you guys? So, um, and also we, I welcome, I love chatting real estate. Anybody just has questions, comments, you know, we, we're here to talk. Um, I'm Liz at midsouthhomebuyers.com. Um, so just L I Z like Elizabeth at company name.com <laughs> mid South home buyers. Um, and the website is midsouthhomebuyers.com. And so the website is almost like a great sort of research Bible. Um, and you can start there and then reach out to me. You can reach out to me. Um, I schedule uh, lots of phone calls with folks all day, every day, as does my team. Um, and be happy just to connect with people, answer questions, help get them oriented, um, what have you. And so, yeah, um, calling is fine, but I think email is the best way to get the ball rolling so I can find out what somebody wants and needs and then accommodate that. Perfect. We'll, uh, we'll be sure to add your contact information to our show notes. And uh, Anthony, you got anything to add here as we close up? 
No, Liz, thanks for taking the time. I know that you are very popular and you've been on some other podcasts and we're thankful you were able to, to share what you guys do and how you help people create passive income and build wealth outside of Wall Street. So thank you for your time and your expertise. Uh, Cameron and Anthony, it's been an absolute pleasure. Super intelligent, really fun, really thought-provoking questions. And I thank you again for having me on. Thanks, Liz. Thanks for listening. And be sure to subscribe so you don't miss out on the next episode. Also, check out our website, infinitewealthconsultants.com to find our podcast along with other additional resources.